Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, so today we're hosting uh, Women in AI panel, uh, and we're going to cover the impact of artificial intelligence in financial services sector. Uh, I would like to say a special thanks to our panelists um, who joined us today uh, to share their insights. Uh, we're here to um, talk about a very interesting topic. Uh, we will talk about uh, diversity and inclusion uh, in the field of artificial intelligence and data science and financial industry as a whole. Um, and this topic is really uh, uh, close to the hearts of our speakers and to us here at h So I'm super excited uh, to host uh, this panel and to moderate it today. Um, also here with us, we have uh, technology and data science leaders from some of the major financial companies in the region. So they will be sharing some insights on applications of artificial intelligence uh, in insurance in payment and banking, uh, financial services, and just what are some of the opportunities and challenges uh, arising from AI adoption in the field. So um, uh, as our panelists, uh, I'm really excited to have um, uh, first Sima Gaur. Um, so she's uh, uh, heading up uh, technology at IFCO Tokyo General Insurance. Uh, we also have uh, Wan Ting Po joining us today. She's the Director of Data Science and Engineering at MasterCard. And we have uh, Parul Pandey. Uh, she's the Data Science Evangelist here at H2O.ai. Uh, and my name is Aksana. I'm Director of Marketing at H2O for APJ Region. Um, I will be moderating the panel today. Um, I just joined H2O two months back, uh, came from AWS, and uh, before that I was with NVIDIA and other technology companies for the past 12 years. So super excited to uh, host today's panel. Um, and uh, the panel uh, today, uh, it's gonna be 45 minutes. Um, so it's really gonna be uh, open discussion. We're gonna open it up to our audience for live Q&A session towards the end as well. But um, as, you know, as we go along, just please free to uh, submit your questions through the chat, uh, through the Q&A widget, and we're gonna address them as well. So, um, and uh, now, I would like to start and uh, first of all, I will pass it to our panelists and uh, let them introduce themselves. Uh, uh, one thing, why don't we start with you? Great, thank you, Sana. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us on this panel. My name is Wan Ting and I lead the MasterCard's Product Development Data and Science and Engineering team in Singapore. I also sit on the board of Gulf Fintech Singapore, which is a non-profit non -profit organization dedicated to eliminating gender gap in tech. I'm very excited to be here with Oksana, Sima, and Paru. Looking forward to some great discussions. Thank you so much, Wanting, and we're very excited to have you. Uh, Sima, would you like to say a few words about yourself as well? Uh, hello, uh, I am uh, Sima Gaur. I head the IT division in IFCO Tokyo General Insurance. Uh, I have had more than uh, 33 years of experience in the IT industry, of which six years is in insurance. And prior to that, I was in the manufacturing sector, similar role heading the one of the plants IT department. And uh, we've been using AI for quite some time for the past more than uh, two and a half years. So I'm quite excited about uh, knowing about what our peers are doing in uh, AI, and especially the role of women in AI in this back region. Thank you. Thank you, Sima. Uh, Parul? Uh, hello, everybody. I am Parul Pandey from h2.ai. Um, equally thrilled to be on this panel. Um, and so I, prior to H2O, I was working with the power uh, distribution sector in India. I work from India. And uh, this is a panel which is very dear to my heart also because I'm also involved in many uh, diversity inclusion initiatives as part of the company and outside and, and really excited to be here. Thank you so much. So um, we have a super amazing panel today. Um, and let's kick off. Um, what I would like to probably start with is just uh, in general, we've been seeing um, a lot of adoption coming uh, from financial companies, um, you know, adoption of data science and AI. Um, and uh, we've seen uh, many companies actually uh, using it to uh, detect fraud, uh, to improve their customer experiences and, uh, you know, to improve uh, credit scoring and a few other use cases. So I'd love to find out from the panelists uh, here today 
Um, how actually uh, is your company using artificial intelligence to transform your business? Uh, um, and, uh, you know, so uh, what are some of the maybe interesting uh, use cases that you've observed AI being applied to? And um, why don't we start with Sim and maybe you, you, you can share some experience uh, from IFCO Tokyo's side. Thank you, Oksana. Uh, as I represent the insurance industry, so insurance, uh, we uh, make use of AI in a big way. Uh, first and foremost is onboarding of customers. That is where we uh, try to pitch in the customers. So uh, we make uh, use of AI for calculating the propensity of buying of certain products by the customers. That is targeted selling. So we have customer analytics, uh, segmentation of customers, and then we try to uh, uh, calculate the propensity of the buying uh, experience of the customer. And then uh, we are making use of uh, bots, that is both a chat bot, voice bots, where using natural language processing, we are able to do the uh, text to speech and uh, uh, IVR. And then uh, the second uh, most important aspect of any insurance company is servicing of customers. So when we talk of servicing of customers, it is uh, the claims. So the claims settlement, we are using AI in a very big way. Uh, we use uh, uh, for the damage car assessment uh, we are making use of image analytics. That is where deep learning is involved. And through that, uh, we enable the customer to click the photographs of the damaged vehicle just at the accident site, upload them through a mobile app. And within minutes, the uh, tool is able to judge what is the predicted estimate of the losses, the parts which need to be uh, repaired or replaced and then once it is uh, uh, accepted by the customer, the estimate is given to the customer. If it is accepted to the customer, the payment is made to the customer within a few minutes. So this is uh, has enhanced the customer experience in a big way. And we are making use of uh, this uh, damage assessment, a cognitive damage assessment for claim settlement for the past more than two and a half years. Apart from it, uh, AI is also being used for fraud analytics. That is. Uh, for uh, you know, uh, detection of fraud, prevention of fraud, especially in the case of claim settlement. We can have fraud in motor claims, we can have fraud in health claims. And especially with COVID in the past one and a half years, everything was being settled online. So there are chances where there could be frauds taking place, a nexus between the customer and some dummy hospital and all, and they come up with some uh, fudged bills so that is where we have made use of machine learning in a big way. And uh, we have also made use of uh, AI ML in uh, back, -end, uh, back office processing of invoices where uh, we have uh, uh, privileged, uh, we have facilitated our customers to click uh, uh, the snaps of their invoices using the mobile device. And that data gets input into the system. So we are making uh, use of uh, of course, there is OCR and RPA in between, but yes, for the image uh, analysis, you know, the reading the image and putting the data through NLP into the system, that is where we are making use of uh, AI in a big way. So I am, we are, and we I have looked forward to making use of AI further for our pre-inspection of vehicles the moment we are onboarding the customers and also pre-inspection of property for uh, property insurance, fire and all, sitting remotely. Because in COVID times, uh, it is not easy for my inspection engineers to be visiting sites and doing the survey. So all that we are in contemplating to make use of AI in that. Thank you. Thank you, that's a very wide range of scenarios. Uh, super interesting. Uh, one thing, and what about MasterCard? What are some of the interesting uh, use cases that you apply AI technology to? Yeah, so um, if I can just take a step back, I think technology in general has, has really, or um, AI and other technologies like blockchain, quantum computing and so on, have really propelled um, the financial industry a lot, um, especially in this COVID era where we're seeing everything getting digitalized. And that's where 
um, a lot of our applications lie as well. So um, if I can bucket them, I think a lot of the applications are really an optimization, which results in uh, cost savings um, to the customers as well as to the company itself. Um, our main goal is so that we can make use of the, the data and the, um, the technology that we have to provide our customers with different kinds of uh, solutions that can address the pain points in their businesses. So um, as a real uh, payment rails company, uh, MasterCard uh, works with a lot of other financial uh, institutes as well as other companies. Um, and that's how, uh, that's how one way that we make use of AI and data to provide them um, customized solutions so that they are able to service their customers better. And I guess, um, uh, to, to broadly summarize the kinds of use cases that we've uh, done in MasterCard, it, it really is to prioritize uh, customer centricity and user experience um, in terms of making use of this aggregated and anonymized transaction data that we see on our rails um, to help our customers make better decisions. I see, thank you, one thing. Uh, Peru, I know you work at H2O and you probably have a lot of exposure to uh, various uh, uh, customers actually who are using our platform, uh, leveraging you know, machine learning and AI. Can you think of some uh, interesting use cases that, you know, that comes to mind from your side as well? Yeah, sure. So I think Seema, um, I think very nicely, she actually showed the real life use cases uh, and most of them, I think she covered it even one thing. So, most of them actually uh, fall under, if you would say, like four categories. So there could be a wholesale or commercial banking, like, you know, anti-money laundering or no yap KYC, or they could be retail banking, for instance, you know, customer churn predictions or in-card and payment uh, business uh, could be credit risk scoring or real-time targeting, personalized targeting, and then even for uh, cyber attacks and fraudulent. Uh, so these are the main four areas, I think, uh, uh, and various use cases come under this, but I'll just like to uh, put forth uh, the H2O's uh, perspective, like, because we work with customers, so it's their feedback, the feedback of the, the companies with which we work, and then taking it and, you know, marrying it with the expertise of our in-house team. Um, and that's how we create a product and the essence of the product, uh, which is called H2O Hybrid Cloud, is essentially what they've told, like, uh, it should be able to uh, give a state of the art results, but should not compromise then on uh, the explainability or the accuracy. And that's how we really believe. Uh, we believe that, you know, uh, the technology. Uh, so like uh, Seema said that in COVID times, uh, a, lot of, a lot of financial transactions have gone digital. It's, it's been increased to 20 to 50 percent. And I think even even like after COVID subsides, uh, subsides, which is like, yeah, I'm really praying for that. It will stay so. And so uh, so the companies now have to, you know, sort of compete with each other in the digital arena. And, you know, whenever customers come on the digital side of anything, they expect more. So I think uh, for these challenges, uh, AI and ML, I think they, they provide great solution in terms of not only uh, optimizing your business, but also helping you compete with your competitors. Yeah, and you've mentioned a very interesting point, uh, you know, Parul about actually importance of explainability of AI, right? And like AI being actually open and transparent. And I think it ties nicely with, uh, you know, with diversity topic as well, right? So how actually, how important it is to be able to uh, have transparency of the algorithm and, uh, you know, and sort of uh, <clears throat> uh, transparency and openness of the data as well. So is that uh, one of the critical part that you, uh, you know, uh, see as well? And uh, uh, is it actually achievable to have an open and transparent AI and how that sort of ties to, I guess, uh, diversity as well? So, um so now there are two sides of the same coin. Um, it is essential to, to be able to explain your predictions. I think uh, you should be able to explain it to, to your customers as well. Like for instance, if a customer is denied a loan, the customer should know. 
On the other hand, there are regulatory compliances also, which you have to fulfill. Um, so you just cannot give a black box prediction and say, you know, this is what a machine learning algorithm predicted and we don't know how it did it. So I think, especially for financial sector, it's, it's I think it's very, very important again, because of the compliances and the regulations uh, to follow. And otherwise uh, also, I think, a lot of people today, I think they talk about the biases and they talk about uh, how AI is biased toward a certain gender or a race, but then uh, they don't uh, emphasize so much on creating systems to fight that bias. And I think uh, one of the major problems because bias comes here is uh, because uh, AI is something that still most of the companies, they, they think of something as a magic wand, which they'll sprinkle it at the end. AI is something artificial intelligence and machine learning has to be imbibed in your products and has to start from the stage when you think of the problem. You think from where your data is coming, is your data itself biased? How are you getting the data? Is your team diverse enough? You need to have people, the team should be diverse so that you know they can pinpoint if there are some biases in the starting, uh, uh, as opposed to once your final results are out and then somebody else points it out. So, so that's what I feel. I think having a diverse team, not only in terms of gender, but background, education, race, uh, different experience levels is also essential uh, to having a good AI product. Yeah, I completely agree. And um, so you mentioned definitely AI is not uh, sort of a magic wand, uh, but uh, we still see companies actually getting a lot of benefits, right, of adopting that technology. So. How do you reckon, uh, what are some of the key um, benefits, um, you know, uh, this is the question to the panel that you observe from AI adoption and uh, maybe does it sort of start contribute to, is it the, the main business driver in your organization and uh, do you see it starting contributing to your bottom line as well? Uh, maybe Sima, you can um, cover a bit on that. Yeah, uh, the AI, when I talk of fraud analytics, yes, it does impact my bottom line in a big way because uh, we have seen a huge rise in uh, claims, uh, mainly because of health, uh, COVID. So almost all insurance companies in India have been badly affected. Our loss ratios have gone for a toss. So uh, we feel not that all of them could be a fraud. I don't say that, but yes, we need to be meticulous in assessing and the volumes being so high you have to look uh, at machine to be assisting you. It could be by way of RPA, which in a, a smaller way also makes use of AI because see the invoices coming uh, to you in online manner. And then you have to see what is payable, what is not payable. When you talk of health, you have to match the tariff, the hospitalization, the prescription, the pathology, and so many things are there where you need to input not only the domain expertise, of that of a medical uh, physician, but also see to it that it is complying with what was there as part of the insurance policy, like I'm from the insurance industry. So what was covered, risks that were covered, are the claim bills complying to that? So all this is where we are making use of AI to filter what is payable, what is not payable, and also see and assess if there could be any potential fraud or a suspected fraud in it, generate a score, and then give it to the uh, back office uh, uh, people who are approving the claims. So it has helped us in a big way in uh, my uh, in loss uh, reduction. And not only that, the customer experience, you know, the enhancing the customer experience, or rather I should say, it's more of a customer delight that uh, the cognitive damage assessment that I talked about. So uh, with the customer experience enhancement, we are more likely to retain the customer, the retention customer ratio customer retention ratio should be going up and in a big way it not only impacts my top line but also my uh, you know the uh, operating ratio combined operating ratio of the company that is where and of course the back end expenses back office expenses the more ai i use uh, we are closer to accuracy and decision making which uh, helps or it uh, complements the people behind the machine who are working uh, on the back office to make them more productive and efficient. Thank you. Thank you, Sima. You mentioned uh, uh, customer experience, and uh, I think one thing you also actually referenced it in your 
earlier um, point, right? Like the uh, customer centricity is important and how AI actually helps to drive that. Do you have any maybe concrete examples as well from your experience um, of uh, AI uh, driving uh, customer centricity and uh, improving customer experience? See, uh, when we pitch in for customers, you know, first and foremost, my contact center, the customer contact, direct contact with our contact centers, we have uh, auto speech recognition and text to speech. So the, the first and foremost that we are making use of the customer calls a call center and uh, speaks his, uh, say, uh, some policy number, I want to know the status. Oh, I want to, this is my, I want to know what happened to my claim and all that. So there we have made use of NLP to help the customer uh, serve, self-serve, and there's a machine virtual assistant which is answering the customer. That is the first and foremost stage. The second is when you give the uh, customer the uh, uh, experience of buying and you know there's something like pre-inspecting of vehicle, inspection of vehicle before you uh, buy a policy when there's a break-in, like my previous policy expired say a month back, and today I am to buy a new policy, I have to do some sort of pre-inspection. So we have given this liberty to the customer where they click their own photographs, put it on the portal, and then their job is done. The system gives them a quote, okay, you have, we see the past data analytics is done. We know there is a, if you understand the terms, there is no claim. So there's a bonus given to you, you're earning bonus points. And this is how your sum insured is increased. And now we give you, or we give you a discount on your policies. So it is individual customer centricity. We target the customer. We try to have a 360 degree view of an individual customer. What has been his uh, history with us? How long has he been with us? Loyalty. We also look at the credit score through independent agencies. We look at uh, what is the likelihood that this customer is going to be with me retention. So all that put into place, we give them a targeted, unique customer centric uh, uh, response when the when they come to my contact center, or we also try to see what are the social media touch points where the customer could have approached us. We try to put all of them, do the analytics, and give them the output which is unique to that customer. Thank you so much, Seema. Really interesting. Um, one thing. Um, any example maybe from MasterCard of uh, some of the key benefits of data science AI um, in the business context? Yeah, so I guess um, in, in a, uh, I, I think the development of AI is still very young. Um, we are seeing benefits definitely across organizations uh, in terms of what Sima mentioned, uh, Lina and faster operations. So we are better at doing the same things um, uh, for now. And uh, we are moving to read more and more AI benefits, but what I'm really hoping to see AI do is for us to be able to create new value propositions. Um, that I think it's, it's not that simple, uh, especially with challenges and adoption in AI. I think um, there are still a couple of challenges that companies need to uh, address before we can fully um, be able to uh, reap all these benefits. So one of it is like what Pro mentioned, right? Um, the AI governance that comes into play, um, wh whether we are able to explain to the regulators what we are doing um, in a very effective manner uh, that we are that we, we do know what the AI machine is doing and it's not a black box. So there are benefits that we're reaping, but uh, I do see that there would be a lot more once we can overcome all these challenges. Yeah, definitely. It's not so straightforward, right? And um, to, I guess, become an AI-driven organization. So uh, certainly there are certain challenges uh, that need to be overcome. Um, so you've mentioned a few and uh, maybe Seema as well from your side, um, what are the main challenges that you see to become an AI-driven organization uh, in addition to what Parul and Wanting have mentioned already? Uh, the first and foremost is the culture, you know, the mindset of people to have trust in what a machine is giving. Uh, there's a normal tendency that how much ever good your tool could be. So, uh, I mean, the human being is always superior. So we say that it is not replacing a human being. It is adding on assisting a human being to do that. So first and foremost is the cultural change mindset. The second I feel is a uh, 
uh, enough training uh, data, input data for training of model is uh, because it's a niche field as told by Van that it is just uh, upcoming in the past few years only AI has and ML has become so popular. So for training data set, uh, data, that is cleaning of data, normalization of data and doing away with all that statistical tools and outliers and all. So that is where we spend most of the time and we find it quite challenging. And uh, sometimes we need to take help of the business users that the data input was not appropriate enough for us to be building a model. So we have we make a mix of supervised as well as unsupervised learning that is good. I think there is some technical issue on the SEMA side. Yeah, we lost SEMA for a bit. Um, and let's just give her a minute. Oh, you're, you're back. Sorry, we lost you for the second there. Oh, I see. Yeah. So that is what I was saying that that is what is challenging. Uh, your um, data that we had, uh, input data for training, the training data set, data cleaning, normalization, and building the data for doing the training is also one of the challenging fields that we face today. Thank you so much, Sima. So um, yeah, really interesting discussion. I guess just to maybe switch uh, gears a bit. And uh, uh, we're also here to talk today about um, uh, diversity um, situation uh, in the field of technology and uh, AI and data science. And I've uh, came across some really interesting studies recently that actually uh, highlight that data science currently ranks one of the lowest, if not the lowest uh, field in tech uh, in terms of diversity, gender diversity in this sense. So only uh, less than 15% uh, of data scientists are actually female. So, um, you know, just why, um, why do you reckon there are not more women in data science? I know one thing you are uh, really involved in that um, um, area. So what would be your observation um, on that front? Mm, I am really surprised by the such a low number actually. Um, but my hypothesis is uh, that it's, I think computing since my time in school, which is a really long time, has always been a very male dominant area. Uh, and the, the rise of data science, it's very, very recent, right? Uh, where we start realizing that there are a lot more things that we can do with programming and with data. Um, and, and I guess it's difficult and challenging when you are going into a field where uh, you are a minority and you may not realize that, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm speaking from personal experience as a Chinese in Singapore, I'm very fortunate. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's not a good feeling to, to feel like you're a minority and that people are not aware of, um, you know, diversity inclusion and making it a conscious choice to include people. And hence, I guess the challenges that, that comes in uh, breaking into a, a tight circle like that could, could make people less willing uh, to join data science field. But I do feel like recently, I have seen a lot more graduates, uh, female graduates uh, from data science courses uh, in the local universities in Singapore, which is, really, really uh, good um, move, I think. It's great. And actually it ties to one of the questions that came in as well from the audience asking about uh, if someone is just starting on the field uh, of data science and they want to be um, in the financial uh, services industry, like what are some of the qualities uh, that um, organizations are looking for? Uh, maybe that, yeah, and how, um, uh, the, what would be your advice in terms of developing some of those qualities? So for a fresh um, graduate, I think attitude is the most important, like being able to show that you are willing to learn, uh, that's, that's the most important. But if you'd like to get some experiences in data science or machine learning, um, there are a lot of platforms out there, like Kaggle competitions are a great way to, to start training up your skill sets. And I, I am sure Kaggle has got 
a lot more to share about um, Kaggle competitions. Um, but those are things that shows uh, recruiters or hiring managers that you are actually putting your, your money where it's worth, right? Like um, putting the time to really go into competitions, spend time uh, getting some real life experience. Um, those are the things that would be really helpful. Mm, thank you, Wan Ting. Uh, Parul, do you have anything to add there as well? Um, so uh, I'll say the first uh, thing would be actually to uh, uh, like understand or realize like why you want to get into data science, because I think today what it is happening is uh, data science and AI becoming more of a hype where everybody wants to become a data scientist uh, and they're not understanding like, are they really passionate about this field? Uh, this is a field which requires a lot of continuous learning. So you have to be motivated enough. Uh, I became a Kaggle Grandmaster uh, last year in the times of COVID. And uh, I also have a six year old son. Um, so, uh, you know, so this means there is no age to learn. There is, you could be very young, you could even be like old. But the most important thing is, are you really enjoying? Do you like programming? Do you like solving problems? You like data? You like finding insights from the data? And if you think, yes, you know, this is something that you really enjoy, uh, then uh, if you are a complete fresher, then uh, you could look for mentors. You could, you could join communities. Uh, now, because of COVID, I think a lot of communities have gone online. And so now that's really become global. So you could be in India and you could join a community and attend workshops in US, uh, anywhere in the world. So you have to be really vigilant. You have to, you have to get connected to people on different platforms. And, uh, and as a fresher, uh, learn and you know, grasp as much as you can, and then start creating small and meaningful projects. And so if you are really passionate about the financial industry, then start researching about companies, uh, what kind of work they are doing, what kind of people are there, what are their skill set, and start researching. So if there's a, there's a company which is working on, say, anti-money laundering, start researching about it and then apply. So you have to be prepared before you enter this domain. But the most important thing is uh, your passion in this field. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. And I think, um, you know, uh, that also could be a good um, way, I guess, to address that, um, you know, the gender diversity gap, right? Making sure that uh, igniting that passion in, in girls as well in terms of technology and data science. So, um, I mean, have you uh, maybe seen some of the great examples of uh, in your companies or in communities or even just at the government level of that being done well, like when actually you know, the, in, uh, the industry has been uh, addressing the diversity gap and there are some good example of successfully embracing diversity. Um, uh, maybe one thing you can share some from your end first. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually am really new in MasterCard um, and, but I'm really, really impressed by the diversity efforts that they have at MasterCard. Um, it's not just on gender diversity, Yes, well, they have like an inclusive family building benefit that, that helps um, the LGBTQ community as well. So it's, it extends diversity to so many perspectives that, that, that's um, really impressive to me, I feel. And on my team of data scientists, uh, so I inherited the team and um, we are at 40% females to 60% male. That's not the perfect case yet, um, but it's a lot better than a lot of places that I've seen. And um, I think this, this shows the commitment from the management team um, to, to really drive diversity in the company. And we have like a month long um, awareness programs that keeps running. Um, it, it just happened and it, it talks about sitting at the table and how we can encourage diversity and you know, uh, putting all this subconscious biasness, uh, calling out all this subconscious biasness so that you know what is it that uh, you're dealing with uh, when it comes to diversity, accepting diverse voices. So I, I must say, um, I'm very new in MasterCard, so it's not that biased, but it's, they are, I, I think they are doing a really good job. Thank you, one thing. Um, there are quite a few questions coming from the audience as well. So maybe we'll just uh, start addressing those. Um, so 
Uh, one of the questions is from Edison. Um, he would uh, asking the panelists to share AIML use cases around partnership with ecosystem and how the concern of data privacy uh, slash confidentiality are being addressed. And anyone would like to take a pass and share your thoughts? Uh, Simon, maybe we'll start with you. Uh, I could get the question clearly. What is it? So uh, asking uh, to share AI and ML use cases um, in terms of partnership with ecosystem, but uh, also how the concerns of data privacy are being addressed. Okay, so uh, see, when we talk of, uh, whenever we do analytics, the personal identifiable information is kept aside. It is usually masked and not put in the data model. The model is built uh, uh, other than the personally identifiable information. So it is uh, different from what you actually have. The raw data is, as I said, when we do the cleaning, the first and foremost is removal of personal information. And then the it is gen, uh, generated. It, for us, it is like a statistics, you know, as Parul said, you have passion for the data, you are playing with the data, and it is all data only. There is no personal uh, information attached to it. And when you build models, when you're doing the statistical analysis, even not that, when you're building the AI models, you are writing your code. Uh, and we make use of H2O.AI, so it is automated machine learning, driverless AI. So we, and as such, you have lots of open source available. So you have those codes to be downloaded and you just run them. And uh, it has got, uh, you know, you are just, uh, the uh, personal information is totally hidden or it is not available to the people who are actually uh, operating it. And when we make, uh, when we put it into use, we attach that model with your uh, business applications and that is where it adds meaning to the domain or the business use case where uh, the AI is uh, actually meant to be used. So that is how I think I have been able to reply to the question. Thank you so much, Sima. Um, and just to follow up on that question, so uh, there is one more from Olivia. She's asking uh, whether there have been any adverse impacts of an ethical nature um, and how you might have tackled or prevented this. Uh, one thing, not sure if you would like to take a pass at that. Um, I haven't been involved uh, directly in something like that. Um, but yeah, there have been news articles of comp tech technology companies that have leaked data. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't be able to speak from a first person's perspective, uh, unfortunately, on, on, um, on those cases. As far as ethics is concerned, I don't think uh, we are, there is anything uh, ethical as of now that we say that we are, you know, uh, unethical that we are doing. It is nothing of that sort because it is, after all, a tool which is assisting uh, human to be uh, taking accurate decisions. It is still not, AI has not replaced the human being so far. So I don't see anything uh, unethical as far as use of AI is concerned. And I think our, maybe one, one use case that comes in mind, sorry Sima, is um, the facial recognition one that bias um, the, some of the ethnic groups, right? Yes. They, will not be, they will not be able to recognize people of different races. And I guess it ties back to our topic today on diversity, right? Uh, when we have diversity in voices, Machine learning and artificial intelligence is all about hypothesis. What you put in to your, the data that you put in gives you the output that you get. And so we need different perspectives to help us understand um, that you know, we need to cover these spaces and we need to cover this ground, uh, all these checks, and we need all these checks and balances in place to make sure that um, we are not biased towards a certain gender, a certain race. Um, and yeah, I, I guess it really ties back to the topic today on the need for diversity in a team that builds uh, the AI algorithm.
Thank you, Wansing. Parul, anything from your side? Yeah, so yeah. I think, yeah, uh, I like to just uh, add on to what Wanting says. So that's why it's very important to have diverse teams, um, you know, so that, and also ro uh, robust testing. So when you, before putting your models into production, uh, you have to test them, you have to see what kind of predictions they are giving, and you have to uh, use different sort of testing data set and then keep monitoring your models to see, you know, if they're going stale. And so, so, so machine learning and AI is an iterative process. You have to, you have to, you train your models, you, you monitor them, you put them into production and then you keep testing them. So it's not like one time you create models and that's it, that's all, because you have different data sets that are coming, uh, if you see before COVID, there would have been different data and after COVID, for some of the industries. So it's essential to have this iterative process and also keep human in the loop. Uh, and so all these things have to be kept in mind when you create your AI infrastructure. Thank you, Parul, very good point as well. Um, just a few more questions. So there were, uh, one is actually a bit related. So one uh, is about why is it important? Why is it so crucial uh, to have AI in diversity? in the field of AI. And then also another point is uh, uh, that women actually tend to be right brain dominance uh, on average um, with more virtues of creativity and uh, great emotional balance. Um, um, and with that in view, do you think it is okay to have a slightly skewed representation in various fields? So I'm just curious uh, to hear sort of your thoughts. <laughs> Maybe Parul, you can uh, provide your input. <laughs> So I actually never sort of divide uh, this right and left brain. I think whatever you like, uh, I have always loved maths. I have always loved programming. Uh, and I obviously I can think the other females in the panel. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, there has to be a mix of it. So I can't directly relate to it because uh, I have competed with the boys all my life and I've done well. <laughs> Is. And uh, not primarily thinking from the creative point of view, but I think uh, as a result, like what we are saying and emphasizing on is if if you like what if you if you you're passionate about this field, you like this field, um, uh, it doesn't matter if you're right or left brained. Uh, data science is a diverse field. It has it it requires people from every background. It we require people from health background, we require biostatisticians, we re require psychologists, uh, we require people from humanities, uh, especially if you look at the language uh, modeling and stuff. So we have opportunities for everybody. We don't really require people who are only good in maths or programming. So it's a big, big, big diverse field and the more the merrier in this field and that way we'll be able to quash some of the biases and ethical concerns that people have. I love this, thank you for to add to what she said, you know, uh, being more right brain, like uh, we have tense where we need to see the pattern matching, visualizing, creativity. So, you know, women I find are in fact better than what the males do. Like when I am sitting with my group, of course, they are young boys now. But uh, when I tell them, we, we always have some other, other idea which does not strike them. So we tell them, oh, look from this angle. Look at this, you know. The same data set, you look from a different angle, the creativity, the visualization. So I, I feel uh, women can do better, much better than others. It is only a question of, you know, that uh, they have to be confident and passionate about the data set, about this field. And I feel uh, they could be more, uh, you know, uh, having a more uh, better constructive role in it uh, if they are involved. Thank you, Sima. Um, and we have a few more questions and we have just a couple of minutes to go. Um, this one question is uh, just switching gears a bit. Uh, um, Maggie is actually asking, uh, so for some of the AI applications that you have mentioned, uh, did you use GPU acceleration um, and what were uh, the benefits of yes? I'm not sure Sima if uh, maybe yeah, you can cover that as well. Uh, what did we make use of? Uh, GPU, graphic processing unit acceleration. Yeah. See, we have a GPU-based machine, so we have uh, not big ones, but yes, 
it is used for image analytics and at the same time it is used for my fraud analytics when i talk in my present domain so uh, so the gpus are used mainly when you are training the model in your run time once the model is built and it is put into the application and the application is making that is not where you actually need gpus for gpus we have seen there's a lot of difference without gpu if you train the model it takes hours and hours to churn the data whereas if you are using gpus it is done within say 1 hour or half an hour to finish the same job so we have gone for uh, power machines uh, that is uh, ibm power and uh, ac922 is the one where we have installed the gpus thank you sima um i think uh, just one last question and we are really at, at time so um uh, can you share any industrial use case that involve large volume of data and how did you approach uh, the problem? Uh, maybe one thing, would you like to uh, address that? Um, industry use cases that involve large uh, volume of data. So yeah. the, uh, the data that MasterCard has, uh, like you imagine, it's, it's huge. Um, so I... How we approach that, we are on a Hadoop system for now. Um, uh, so, so we're using the big data stack to help us with the, the manipulation of the data and uh, using um, deep learning for um, the AI part. Um, does that answer the question? Thank you. Yeah, I think it does. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, all right, so we are actually one minute over and I just would like to thank all of you uh, for joining us and thank you uh, panelists for sharing your insights. I think it was really interesting. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as uh, I did. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. So um, we're gonna uh, uh, have a short survey displayed uh, after the end of this session. We'd love to hear your feedback in terms of uh, how we can improve for future events. And uh, we will also be sharing the recording of this um, uh, with everyone via email. And once again, thank you to our panelists and thanks to everyone for attending today's event. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.